Oh god! Ah, this is why we don't let you do things. Oh my I already want to leave. That's a nice little warm up for you there. And speaking of warm ups, what are our names? My name's Political Slime. I'm Lego Master. I'm Indy. We have two guests. One of them is a very esteemed member of a podcast you may be familiar with. It has three letters. Yes, of course, I am talking about the, the CHC. CHC. There we go. <laughs> Oculus Nuva. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Cliff Horse Crew podcast. We're so excited to have such an esteemed member of such a professional podcast on our show tonight. Also, we have Meso. He's here too. Listen, I'm just here to have some fun and share with you guys some interesting fun facts. You know what else has the word fact in it? Factory! We're talking about Hero Factory today! What did you guys think about Hero Factory when it first came out? Uh, it sucked. No, I'm kidding. I remember back when, before it came out, everybody was still kind of reeling after G1 ending, so there was that natural, like, lashback against any kind of new theme that was going to crop up, and it never really escaped that initial stigma. It was better than Ben 10, for sure. It was better than Ben 10 because it was actually like Bionicle, you know? The first wave launched, and it was basically Bionicle with a couple new parts. It was only with the next year they really started to branch out, but it never really, I would say, got over that initial shift of, like, Bionicle's legacy hanging over it. People came around, me being one of them. I became a huge Hero Factory fan. Out of everybody in TTV, I'm probably the only one that truly, like, loves Hero Factory <laughs> because I came into the online community right at the end of G1. I never really got to be a part of the Bionicle fandom. I was part of the Hero Factory fandom, so that was kind of my shtick. I was actually kind of the same way. I joined BZP, like, the summer of 2010, which I think was when Hero Factory started. And I remember the reason I, like, got into it was because I was all up in arms about Bionicle. Bionicle being murdered. And so they had like a hotline on the Hero Factory website. I called up that hotline and they were like, hello, welcome to the Hero Factory hotline. How can we like save you or whatever? As a 12 year old, there's me on the line and I was just like, where did Bionicle go? Like <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the Hero Factory hotline. They were like, check out the heroes stopping Von Nebula. And I was like, dang it. And I just kind of hung up. It was a rough start. Inspiring story for the ages. It was rough, yeah. Being the naive child that I was when Bionicle was ending, I was sort of completely oblivious to the fact that it was actually ending until maybe halfway through the year. It wasn't until like I checked the Lego shop to see if a set was still there and I saw like most of the sets were gone and nothing new came out so I sort of had to figure it out the hard way. I sort of still had that bitterness towards Hero Factory. I did definitely have my doubts during the first year. I remember the very moment that I like started to think positively of HF was pretty early on. It was when we saw the first leaks, the first set names came out because we had seen the pictures circulating. We'd heard rumors because back then I was really into like leak culture and stuff. I knew Bionicle was ending for like a good six months because people had leaked it. Nobody believed the leaks, but then it was like, I had time to kind of grieve and get over it and all that, like before HF even launched. And it was when the HF leaks came out and we were looking at the names and we saw Jimmy Stringer explode with an X, <laughs> no E. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a fun line. My utter disappointment came when like, as a kid, I was like, okay, let's give this a shot. I bought one of the smaller heroes and I think it was bulk. And then I put together like him and I realized that one of his arms was just one piece. And I was like, mother of God, this isn't good. Yeah, we don't like to talk about that. That was a dark time. I don't like time. to remember the weapon arms. I think the first wave kind of had like a good starting point, all things considered. I really enjoyed the villains. The, the villains, villains were really were fun. Some of them have a little bit of awkward builds to them. Oh, like totally. You, Von Nebula with no elbows. Rotor is still one of my favorite like Bionicle style sets that ever come out. Yes, Rotor. Rotor. Never it's forget. Rotor. I loved him. Uh, <laughs> I got two of Rotor. I loved him wow. so much. It was a fantastic set. Well, it's because like the heroes were just, they took the Avatoran build and they made it slightly better, I guess because their limbs weren't bent 90 degrees. You know, they were, like, more natural looking. But other than that, they were basically the same thing, except bigger pieces of plastic. It was the villains that were like, okay, these are kind of continuing the Bionicle that we know, and kind of like... Honestly, I don't remember having any kind of distaste towards Hero Factory when it came out. Like, I think I would have been more upset if Greg hadn't continued the story for a year, because... To me, the story was always the highlight of my Yeah, no, I agree. I enjoyed the sets. That's not to say, you know, like, ooh, the sets are terrible, but Hero Factory also had sets. So what was the difference? I thought Hero Factory had a really good initial concept. Like, it's, it's going to sound kind of weird, but Hero Factory was kind of like a sci-fi version of Bionicle, which kind of makes no sense. But like, you know, it was kind of like a more of a spacey theme. Yeah, it was. Which was kind of cool. It was cool. more like traditional. I felt as a kid that like you could use your imagination more. Like, oh, this thing I made came from some awful planet. Well, I mean, really, that was the whole like intent behind the theme 
it was supposed to be okay we take away the complex story all those years were the backlog and we just bring in this clean slate and it's encouraging creativity because unlike bionicle where there were a ton of rules and restrictions and like species and all this stuff you could basically do whatever in hero factory and it could exist somewhere in some kind of form it worked in the sense that kids were more inspired i think it backfired because it lost a lot of structure oh totally in terms of creating new fans i think it did good but when it came to like getting bionicles fan base over to hf it kind of failed yeah just a I bit agree. but i like the first wave you know all things considered it started off strong it was more like a bridging the gap kind of a thing but there were a notable amount of good sets that came from it enough to like give me a positive impression still to this day i do not own a single set from hero factory 2010 really you should get some get the ferno bike it's a gym it's like one of the best things. Explode was one of my favorite sets to get because of the like piece variation. It's like I had two of that set and like it gave me some awesome pieces to work with. It was like red spiky armor pieces. Those were so fun to work with. Totally right. No, no, no. I just have a lot of good memories of HF 2010. The only thing I didn't like about it was all the pieces broke because they were still <laughs> brittle. You know, they hadn't fixed that Also, yet. how about those great Nickelodeon... Was it a TV show? Is that what it was? It was a TV show. And it was garbage. It was like I was first TV show since Galador for construction. And I think in general, I think HF did premiere before like Ninjago or anything. I liked Rise of the Rookies. I thought that one was good. They did sort of seem to get progressively worse but I really did think Rise of the Rookies was decent. Can I bring in a controversial opinion? Time to become the meso that you all know and tolerate in the TTV podcast. Oh, man. Rise of the Rookies was better than Journey to One. Oh, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Journey to One had one thing that it did better than Rise of the Rookies, and it's a pretty big thing. It's not to devalue Journey to One. It had a lot of cool stuff going for it. The art style. The art style is just beautiful. It's way better with Journey to One. It looks better. I'd argue that the art style for Rise of the Rookies, it's by the same people who did The Legend Reborn. I don't know. It seems to fit Hero Factory a lot more than it fit Bionicle, just because, I don't know, it's like kind of everything is a bit gritty. And... Yeah, they did a really good job with the gritty type metal and robot stuff rather than biomechanical. Rise of the Rookies had some problems. Not gonna deny that at all. It was a kid's show. It had very cheesy dialogue, poor fight scenes that were just like shooting lasers at each other, whereas Journey to One had like some hand-to-hand -hand combat and like elemental stuff. HF's battles nine times out of ten poured down to like pew 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 shooting the lasers from behind cover. Don't hide behind the explosives. <laughs> In terms of, yo, yeah, get away from the explosives. <laughs> it's rotor. You're triggering me right In now. In terms of an actual story, though, the characters were cliches. They were cookie cutters. They were like the most simple stereotypes you could possibly do, but they worked, and they had a character progression, simple though it might have been. Stormer was the tragic hero with the dark past, and Inferno was the crazy rookie who's out to prove himself and Breeze and Surge were the quirky sidekicks. Bulk was like the comic relief, the stupid guy. Stringer was the country musician. We appreciate that they made rock and roll an element. Yes, it was wonderful. It was just so good. And like all the characters, with the exception of probably Breeze and Stringer, who never really grew at all, had a character path that they did follow. It was simple, nobody's gonna deny that, but it existed. Unlike in Bionicle G2, where the characters' personalities weren't even consistent between year to year, and they had no arc to speak of whatsoever. You could argue that some of the heroes, I guess maybe not from the initial wave, but definitely some of the more later heroes kind of lose their personalities over time. Oh, they totally do. It gets worse and worse. Speaking of losing personality, Evo. Yeah. <laughs> I heard an interesting theory, which I sort of accept this as my headcanon. In Ordeal of Fire, he's sort of like the Zen dude. He's got like a really deep voice and stuff, but it didn't really fit him as a rookie. But then in Breakout, he sort of transitioned to the super rookie rookie, almost Ferno, Rise of the Rookies type character. And yes. I'm not gonna lie, I read this on the Lego message boards, but this is like the only good thing to come out of there. You just lost all your credibility. I don't know how many people know about like the Quasa transplants, where if you get your hero core destroyed, but you get a transplant, your entire personality is sort of wiped and replaced with something else. And that explains why his voice and his personality and just everything about him is different. Interesting theory. You want to know what actually did happen? Nex and Evo's personalities were switched. On the what? website, the character bios were different, and Nex had Evo's personality and Evo had Nex's personality. In the TV show, they inverted that, and they made Nex like the super into social media and stuff. He's like the friend 
friendly, happy-go-lucky dude, and they made Evo like this calm, meditating, kung fu master. But then Nex got written out of the story. In Breakout, from that point on, he never showed up again. So Evo was left the only one in the story, so they fixed their mistake and they reverted him back to his original Aww. intended personality at the effect of contradicting what they had written for the last two waves. I don't think I ever finished Brain Attack, and I don't think I ever watched Invasion from Below. You should watch Invasion from Below. That is hilarious. They changed, like, all the voice actors around. And, like, <laughs> they really? <laughs> it was a 20-minute commercial. None of their personalities were retained. It's like, you could watch Invasion from Below as a standalone thing without knowing any prior knowledge. And they took off their helmets. They're so creepy, dude. Uh, <laughs> they took off their anyway. helmets? Oh, no. What? Yeah, it, it's bad. I had a few of the 1.0 sets, and what I would do is I would take them apart, but I wouldn't take apart any of the joint pieces because I knew they'd break. And so I would kind of make, like, quasi-combo models with just trying to connect them without taking them apart. I went over to a friend's house one day, and a friend was like, oh, you know, I can take apart these pieces with, like, a special technique, and they won't snap. I was like, are you sure? And he was oh, like, no. yeah, absolutely. I handed him my Ferno and my Surge, well, like and he took them apart. And it was fine. And then he put them back together, and then they all snapped. Oh. Uh, that is my one big gaping problem with 1.0. Which, thankfully, that issue was resolved in the next year, 2011, Ordeal of Fire. Ha ha ha, segue. The year that I got into Hero Factory. It was a good year, but in hindsight, it's kind of hilarious, because, like, it pioneered CCBS. That was its thing. I like some of the sets. I thought they had some good sets. Am I alone in that? I'll agree. They had some good sets. And then they also had some... Firelord was pretty good, I thought. He was good for the role that he filled, okay. which was the first Titan CCBS set. I will agree with you there. When I got him, I liked him. But seeing, like, where the formula evolved from there, it's like... Right. Yeah, no. Whenever I, like, think of Firelord, this is the picture that leaps into my head. I speak like, yes. <laughs> the <first laughs> on Earth Work is of that. art. It's way worse than I remembered. To be fair to Firelord, it's just a bad angle. No! It's not a bad angle! That's what he looks like from every angle that isn't the <laughs> Box art. I owned him. He was awful. When I say bad angle, I mean like his leg supports aren't properly attached in that picture. Like it's just flopping around. The actual set, like, you know, it's not much better. But it had some cool stuff. Like it had lava prints and the armor. The thing with a lot of the Hero Factory 2.0 sets, I find, is that they only really look good from one main angle. All of the 2011 original heroes, I will say that they have some of my favorite pieces in CCBS, which is the 2.0 chest piece. I absolutely love the 2.0 chest piece. I don't know what about it. I just find that it gives them a very heroic and filled in look when used correctly. But all of those sets have abysmally uncovered backs. It's awful. Never forget Nitro Blast and the greatest hodgepodge ever. I liked Nitro Blast. I had Nitro Blast. He was great until I realized that he was absolutely hard. I really hate to say this, but I'd honestly say that Jetbug was the best looking one, and he did he not was, look very good. He was fine. He was covered okay. That was the only redeeming factor compared to the other. It's when you say these sets, you can clearly see it's in its infancy. Like, CCBS, they were basically just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. <laughs> like, can we do a Titan like Bionicle where they did like the double leg kind of a thing, give him stability, let's test it and see how it looks. Let's do this set, Drill Dozer, and let's do like <laughs> dual masks like we did in 09 to reuse stuff, and let's give him a tail with a launcher and stuff. They tried, they really did. They don't look good, though. <laughs> They're testing ideas at the expense of, like, making cool sense. They were kind of a gold mine of parts. They were. Even if they were terrible. It's because, like, every part was new. That was the joy of getting them. Like, almost every piece you got was just brand new. For all that Ordeal of Fire did right, and all that it did wrong, though, it did deliver my second least favorite Hero Factory set of all time, and that is Ferno 2.0. Oh, that's sad. Uh... Everyone bashes on Ferno 2.0. No, it's terrible. <laughs> I'll be honest, I kind of like him. Oh, no, He looks like, so bad. goofy. I hate the arm. The one thing I can defend that everybody else hates is I don't mind the goggles. It would have made sense on like a character like Nex. It doesn't make sense on the main character of the line. Like It looked like it would like, belong to like some like heck heavy character. It would have been like putting freaking googly eyes on Tahu or something. He just looks so funny <laughs> because you have the goggles and then you have the stupid headpiece that like, has the permanent smirk. <laughs> oh. like, looks... Yeah, the smirk is what ruins it I think. Those goggles by themselves I find are a really cool piece. It's just that combined with the smirk does not work. I was a big fan of Nex. He was the 
one that I wanted to get the most, yeah. It's a problem that probably Nex and Breeze have the most, is their head coverings or their visors, I don't even know what to call them, just look really odd. Nex looks like he has a football chin strap, and Breeze completely wipes away any femininity that she's supposed to have. It's like they went back to 2006 Holly. If there was one thing that I did like about HF 2.0, more than anything else, and it's the thing I wish they had worked on in future years, was the visor system. It was something fresh. It wasn't a helmet. It also wasn't a mask, per se. It was something new. It was their attempt to try to, like, add a little bit more variety. I would just wish they had refined it a little bit, fixed the ones that looked weird, made some better ones that fit the head shape better. Because I could have seen them doing a ton of crazy stuff like gear packs like you buy a gear pack and instead of like multicolored masks you get like a weapon a new visor piece and like a unique printed armor piece that you could like deck out your hero with and like do all sorts of customization stuff with them and it really worked for hero recon team because you could interchange the pieces a lot and get like different color mixtures and stuff yeah there's definitely a lot more variety than like whatever breakout gave us which i do like breakout a lot but it just it's they, they were just up. regular full head molds. They went back. Like, even with 3.0, they went back. Like, they ditched all this and just did the huge animal heads. Do you think that the visors would have worked better? And do you think they could have been continued if that was HF's kind of starting point? From the little bit that I heard in the fan community back then, people were kind of ticked off that they had basically gotten rid of the characters' personalities with the visors. They, you know, the mask is such an identifiable aspect that the characters that we had come to know as Stormer and Inferno and all of that, they just lost that personality with 2.0 yeah, I agree. and only really regained it in Breakout. You are completely correct. Popular opinion hated the visors because people love masks. People like helmets, masks, whatever. They like that concept. I like the visors just because they were trying something new and I feel like it worked for what HF's goal should have been, which was really hone in on the customization. Like Hero Recon Team was the greatest thing that HF ever did. It was its biggest innovation and it only lasted about a year. Had it actually been successful, I feel like stuff like this, the more options, the better. Because the flip side of that is, when you make a mask, people were always like, alright, so if I try to use a how on any kind of mock whatsoever, the first thing people are always going to recognize it as is Tahu's mask. Just because there's that stigma associated with a character. With the gear pieces, though, it does lose personality. You're totally right, and most would agree it's not the best route to go. But I thought it was cool for HF because it was, like, interchangeable. What seemed to be Hero Factory's mission, which was build your own heroes, which Bonacle kind of had, but they never really honed in on it, and and to be fair, Hero Factory didn't either. It's because people didn't, like, understand what Recon Team was, I don't think. Or HF was just too simple back then to have a lot of appeal behind it. But if it had been, like, launched a few years later, like if Bionicle had launched with something like that, I feel it would have been much better because CCBS would have evolved by then. Part of the Hero Recon Team reason why it worked was because of the simple figure build. It was really a case of just kind of, you build a basic skeleton and you drag and drop pieces on it. That's something that like a seven-year-old can easily do in whatever kind of LDD style program they had. And I don't know if it could really work for modern G2 Bionicle with all of the Technic stuff. They also auto-generated instructions for it. Custom instruction booklets for your particular model complete with name and everything. And every time that I think about it, I'm just like, man, rip Makuta G2, am I right? Yeah. I made this when I was young and I got it for my birthday. It was so edgy. But I James, it was so Shadow. James Shadow. Nothing personal, kid. Slime knows about this, but I wrote a story for it and that was like awful. It was wonderfully edgy in every single way. Also so completely grammatically incorrect. Speaking of stories, so from a storyline perspective, do you think it would have been better for Ordeal of Fire to stick with the six main heroes that they'd had in the line before? Or do you think that the addition of Nex and Evo was a good thing? It was bad, no question. I was honestly going to say I really did like the addition of them. I like them. more variety. I like them as characters. I prefer Nex, Evo, and Raka to like some of the original members, like Bulk and Surge and Breeze are kind of like the weaker people. But for the theme as a whole, it caused them to lose focus because characters just disappeared for years on end because they can only fit six into their roster. I would have liked if they had a yearly thing where one wave is Alpha Team. Like the Alpha Team that we all know, next wave is the new guys. That would have been cool. If they'd had 
evolve. Over the course of one year, you get two different sides of the story. I would have liked that. It just got bad when they had, like, nine characters and they didn't fully commit to, like, two teams. They were just like, all right, we'll put these guys on the bench for, like, a year or two. Nex and Stringer just fell off the face of the earth. Why did they die? I don't know. Because they were my favorites. I like their set. They didn't die, but, like, they got written out of the story. Like, they just never showed up again after Breakout. Stringer went out on a very good note. He had a really good set. Pun intended? But then... Pun intended? Oh, my God. Ah, uh, no. But then brutal. Nex had such a bad set. He was like my least favorite Hero Factory set. One of, at least. Let's not jump forward to break out. We can't sequence break. We gotta talk about <laughs> yeah, Savage man. Planet. No, we're breaking out, dude. Oh, you're being savage so, over there. Savage Planet. It's when they all turned into furries. It had its hits and it had its misses. Ferno was definitely a miss. Witch Doctor was the biggest hit. Oh, Witch Doctor, Doctor there so goes good. down in history as the greatest Hero Factory set of them all. He's the best CCBS Titan. I don't think there's much denying that. I feel like the heroes were weird. The animal heads were an interesting idea, but they weren't for everybody. Rocka pulled it off, I thought. Rocka XL was a spectacular train wreck. He didn't pose well at all. <laughs> but the villains, the beasts themselves, were really oh, good. Oh, the beasts yeah. were good. They were oh. creative. I'll be completely honest. Raja is probably oh, Raja. one of, if not my single favorite CCBS set. He's raw from the jaw. He's got such good like proportions, posability, all his parts are good. All the villains were fresh designs. They were nothing like what we'd seen before. They actually looked like cohesive and well put together. The heroes were more of a mixed bag, but there were more hits than misses, I'd say. It also brought me the unquenching thirst I had for a Boda Magna year for Bionicle, so that was good. And the TV special for it was really good as well. I very much enjoyed that. Savage Planet is where... It peaked at its story. Everything from there, it went downhill because of like plot holes and cliffhangers that were unresolved. Breakout. The year that came next. Breakout's HF's best year. They were firing on all cylinders. I said the story for Savage Planet was the best just because it didn't have like plot holes and cliffhangers, but the TV special for Breakout as a package is the best one. If you treat it as a standalone thing and not like Rise of the Rookies go it was a character progression. They did have character arcs through like the four episodes. Breakout had two and they had to deal with like seven characters so it was a bit more cluttered and the story wasn't as tight knit but I feel like just as a package deal like all the villains were incredibly creative and diverse from each other. And every single hero, it's the only year where everybody got a set form as part of one group. Did we really ever get a resolution, like, who set them free or anything like that? Never at the all. The spirit of Von. It was wow. never explained. I thought there was some sort of explanation at least to how they got broken out. I mean, we know how they got broken out. It was Von Nebula's spirit who got trapped inside the black hole orb staff, which was locked in the Hero Factory, and somehow it either possessed Voltix, much in the same way that Makuta possessed people in G2 to do his bidding, even while he was locked up, or Voltix been a part of Von Nebula's crew, and he was like, oh, we got a fallback plan in case you ever get arrested and I just so happened to be locked up. Do this, do this, break the staff, and you'll set my spirit free. And then you'll, like, cause some vortex or whatever. It was really vague, but they never fully followed up on it. Props of Nebula on that, you know. You know what he was doing. But then he was never featured in the story again. <laughs> I like to imagine how HF actually ended in my headcanon was just Von Nebula succeeded, took over the world, and killed everybody. That's dark, I guess, but it would never float your boat myself. So. Yeah. I don't think they did too great with the revelations, to be honest. No. <laughs> Rocka was a secret agent and part of the Hero Recon team, which has never been mentioned once in the story prior. That's an interesting plot point. I did not remember. Actually. I don't blame you, because it was never followed up on. It was just like dropped like a rock. Like a Rocka! Like a Rocka! Rocka. Uh, Oh, no. They had to shoehorn in the recon team somehow. Yeah, even though it had already been cancelled by that point, so... I don't know why they even bother. It was just sort of like a slap in the face. The main thing I liked about it was because all heroes got shown in a set form. They were clearly part of the same group. Like, everybody had a cohesive form. You could say, this is the Hero Factory team. It's the only year where you can say that. And almost all of them had very unique style. Like, I'd say with the exception of, like, Surge and maybe Breeze. But otherwise, they each had, like, pretty unique new upgrades to them. And Nex, I guess. Poor Nex. His arm looks cool. It's just the face looks pretty dopey. He looks like he's constantly frowning. He does this is not amused. They should have just given him back his tiger face. They did a pretty good job with Evo, though. Evo was good. Evo had some good asymmetry going on with him. The whole tank arm thing. Of course, it didn't fit his personality at all, but of course, who cares about personalities at this point? Yeah, that was the right? point of the show where they started to just, like, throw stuff out. Like, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. The other big thing that Breakout had going for it was the game. It was one of the biggest undertakings HF ever did. It was when they actually started promoting their games in the set. If you buy a set, you get points towards this game on the back 
of the Hero course, there's a code and you can put it in at the website. And I remember Breakout got a lot of flack when it came out, but it was actually pretty in-depth. Like there was a lot of customizability. There were secrets you could collect on every stage. There were like replayability because there were challenges and achievements and collectibles and all sorts of secret stuff you could do. Its main problem was that they'd never put in a level for Nex, which is a little ironic because he's actually featured in this one promotional image for the Breakout game, but he was never actually in the game. So rip him! The Doom Box was probably one of my favorite Lego books. It featured Core Hunter, which was like, I know he's edgy, but he was like my favorite set. He just looked really that was the cool. other thing that Breakout kind of had trouble with. They had to cut out like three plot lines from the TV show. It felt like they were starting to expand their story. That was the year where they said, right, we're going to do this. We're our serialized style of storytelling. It's alienated some people. Let's have a plot. Let's throw in some plot twists and intrigue and cliffhanger endings and build for the future. And you know what? Why the heck not? Let's get books. Let's get a game. Let's get a marketing budget. Let's commit and make this thing great. And then 2013 happened. Yeah, they nailed it with Breakout and and then they broke the nail head with Brain Attack. The whole idea of Brain Attack, which is brains attacking, the way it was handled was just awful. If there was like a way to pop off the brains or something like that, then it's like, okay. But in order to like do anything with it, you have to rip off the face of whoever villain that you've got, rip the brain off, put the face back on, and then you have something that looks like a set that's missing its brain. The whole concept behind it is fine, but the execution is fairly lacking. Brain Attack more than any other way of here factor it could have been so great and they did a lot of good stuff that people don't give them credit for but they just bungled it at every possible opportunity they just wasted all the potential the visors for the heroes cool idea but it looks bad they're too tall they look ugly <laughs> everybody no. has the same looking kind of head the villains they came up with mask pieces that actually fit on like masks they went back to that but they were nigh unusable for anything because of the stupid brains which were their eyes and they had to align with the headpiece and do all this crazy stuff. New headpiece that can function as mask or helmet, but it's too small to properly line up with any of the stuff released prior, and it was made to fit these stupid head molds that weren't great. The TV show, I don't want to talk about it. It's bad. It was really small and short and unfulfilling, and they tried to bring back a character arc that had never been touched upon in the actual show before, even though it was mentioned offhandedly in some Lego Club magazine when the theme launched about Surge being insecure, and like they tried to make him like relevant again <laughs> yeah. but they didn't do it right i just want to say bulk smash bulk smash was good i liked it the thumbnail for that video that lego master linked perfectly represents my thoughts towards brain attack the potential where did it go i can't <laughs> find it all the qualities just spilled over the ground and i can't pick it up it's basically hero factory shrek there were a lot of good elements to brain attack it could have been so much better it could have been one of the theme's best years because they did so much stuff they brought back functions they tried to like get some complexity back colors that had been absent for many years came back like metro red or whatever they tried to like introduce some cool new elements like protecting the hero cores with the exo force arms which made no sense because the brains didn't actually attack the hero cores they attacked the heads so i don't know why they'd need to protect their hero cores it was stupid and it made no sense in story but it looked cool from a set uh, anyway i ran over it makes me mad brand attack makes me mad as far as villains go like breakout had such a wide variety of different types of villains and in brain attack they just sort of end up looking the same. They're pretty much all humanoid. Yeah, they're all humanoid, except for uh, Dragon Bolt. Dragon Bolt was cool. The second best HF set besides Witch Doctor, I am up. But the rest of the villains paled in comparison. Kind of like Aquagon. That was the good guy of Hero Factory, right there. <laughs> That's the picture I always look at when I'm like, good old Aquagon. That was supposed to be his function. He could combine his swords, but look at how stupid that looks. <laughs> his head is completely flat. It's <laughs> flat. Just to blow out the candle on the ugly cupcake that was Brain Attack, that game was not great. They like, took away almost all of the depth that Breakout had been building to and they just made it an app game and that set the precedent for what we got in Bionicle because apparently they made a ton of money off that game with their microtransactions and they were like oh we'll just do mobile games from now on. Invasion from Below was a wave of highs and lows. Some of the highest highs and some of the lowest of 
above lows, bar none. Garbage is the word. Listen, that I would use. invasion from below is important because they integrated many things. Just like how the bionicle system sets were important. I think these pulled it off better. There was some cool stuff that Invasion from Below had with many figures like Ferno's jet machine, Rock's stealth machine. The villains were like Kaiju. I still to this day do not own a single Invasion from Below set. Same. I do not either. Me neither. But I want to. I really love what they had going just with the minifigure mech system. Mocking wise, they had some really nice parts that you could probably use to make some really cool custom mechs. Earlier I mentioned that Ferno 2.0 was my second least favorite Hero Factory set ever. There is one that does supersede it, and that is Evo Walker, which is the worst <laughs> oh, thing ever released. Yeah. I want to do HF reviews for TTV, but I don't want to buy Evo Walker. I'm almost like refused to get it out of principle. <laughs> and I remember what was rich was they tried to do combo models. Put all the mechs together with the Evo XL machine, and you get this thing, which was the Evo Combi machine. What? Oh, man! <laughs> that is beautiful in the most terrible of ways. If we're talking about Hero Factory combiners. There's one that you can never, like, not mention. Lucas Valor. Yes, Lucas Valor. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> it's amazing. It's the most wonderful combiner of all time. I love him, dude. He's got, like, it's personality. It's the most beautiful got, thing, like, dude. a mustache, I think. The Invasion from Below was a little wonky. They had some bad stuff, but they did have some good stuff, like Queen Beast. It had a cool-looking beast and the only good mech that Evo got. They had Crystal Beast, because back before dinosaurs roamed the Earth and transparent parts weren't oversaturated, this set was nice to get because it had a lot of trans bloom. People loved it. And then, you know, the minifigures, I think, were all right. If there's one thing that does irritate me about the HF TV specials, it's when people look at them and say Invasion from Below was their favorite because it looked good. Kai says that opinion a lot, and we've gotten into debates about it on TTV. And it's because the people who say that are the people who believe that HF never had any depth whatsoever. And that, like, oh, the character dynamics were nothing important. Who cares if they changed the voice actors? They're all interchangeable. Who cares if they had three years worth of unresolved back-to-back -back cliffhangers that had nothing to do with one another because the story didn't matter anyway, you know? Who cares if it was standalone? But HF had a lot of potential. They were trying to do better. I don't know what happened behind the scenes. They decided to end it and bring Bionicle back earlier than they planned. Or if my current theory nowadays that HF was just one giant test bed for ideas for Bionicle G2 and they were just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what stuck. It's like, I don't know why LEGO did what they did with it, but I think it had a lot more more good stuff than people give it credit for. And it irritates me when people are like, oh, I had nothing whatsoever to offer. Going all the way back to the first year, Hero Factory FM, best radio station of all time. I love it so time. much. That was when HF was in it. It's probably it was comedic. It was self-aware. It was too. like, oh, it's so good. FM was great. I'd advise anybody who hasn't heard it, just give it a listen. You'll find it entertaining. That's what kind of catapulted me into Hero Factory was like, this is the first thing after Bionicle. Bionicle still has a story online, but look at this. This is cool. It's funny. It's yep. different than Bionicle. As the quality of the sets got better, the story got a heck of a lot worse. Usually Wadge outros, but Wadge isn't here, so I'll outro. Together, united, evil never triumphs over Hero Factory. <laughs>